All right. Thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in. We appreciate you. Um, we have a lot to get going to. Normally, I talk and George gets mad, so I apologize. I'm not going to do that today. George, give us some love on our, to our sponsor and then tell us a little bit about our guests, and then let's get them on. Absolutely. And just so you guys know, I am out of town, so I'm doing this uh, from an Look undisclosed you. location. <laughs> you're, you're, you're like an adult. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. So, but anyway, uh, the counterpart show is brought to you by Wellness Resources, a 35 year old nutritional supplement company that has been on the forefront of clinical nutrition for 35 years. Find out why they are one of the best supplement companies in the world. Make sure you go to myvitaminresource.com. And if you enter the promo code counterparts, you will get free shipping on all orders. All right. So let's talk a little bit about our guest. Uh, today, we're going to, like John mentioned, we're going to be speaking with Mr. Rick Dugdale. Now, uh, Mr. Dugdale is a Canadian film producer and director. He's the president and CEO of Enderby Entertainment and an independent, an independent film finance and production company. He is also the co-founder of Viewly, a premier platform for collecting, watching, and trading exclusive limited edition feature length films and collector NFT film content. In 2021, Rick directed the film Zero Contact featuring Anthony Hopkins, which was the first feature film to be released via the Viewly platform. And John, I watched that film not long ago. So interesting. And I'm very excited to talk about how it was made. So without further ado, let's bring up Mr. Rick Dugdale. Yeah, and yes. we have hey guys. Also Cam Canada is actually on as well. We're Absolutely. Right. All right. Let's bring him on. Yes, hey there he right. is. There we go. All right. How are you? Great. How are you Excellent. guys doing? Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, no, this is uh, our pleasure. I'm sorry we, we uh, don't have a whole introduction for you, Cam, so I apologize. Uh, you know, no problem. We'll, we'll, maybe uh, our next show will just open with that. So just <laughs> All right. Something in there. <laughs> But we want to thank you both for being on. We, uh, as as we, uh, as George said, we did see uh, zero contact, and man, you know one of the, the things that 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 was really uh, that was really the most creepy was that it's the visual that we've been seeing for the last two years. Right, That's for real. Visually, right. visually, right. visually, that is what we see. Yes. Yeah. So there were things in there that look exactly like how my screen looks right this second, except right. it was creepy <laughs> and the music and everything, and I was like. Wow. And so it was very, very well done. I was very impressed with uh, with how I have no idea how <laughs> you had to direct <laughs> such a film. But I guess we're going to start first. Uh, Rick, um, I just want to tell us a little bit how that process started. And I mean, obviously, we know that the pandemic created the sort of the need for creativity. And that was one way that I thought was brilliant. What was the process for that uh, getting started with something like that? Well, you know, first off, I think the thing is, is that when we made the movie, we didn't think it was going to go on for two and a half years. And so you kind of now that it's like two years now, we're extremely exhausted of seeing. Ah, stuff I on didn't Zoom. think about that. Right. Uh, <laughs> so that, you know, the process we made it, you know, it, it was by the time we made it, it went through post. It was still, you know, nine, ten months by the time the film was completed. But, wow. you know, I think it was it was week one, I think, of the pandemic. And, you know, Cam and I are partners and. And he's a talented screenwriter. He's obviously the screenwriter, not just of this film, but many others. And we had a think tank and we had uh, international partners that we worked with because what people didn't realize is that in Japan, you were shut down. In Germany, you were mm -hmm. shut down. And in Sweden, you were shut down. So we kind of had our colleagues who are all, you know, very successful uh, filmmakers join the think tank. And we said, well, OK, how do we make a film if we're going to you know, be in a world like this? And so we hung up the call. I think you and I spoke that night, Cam. And That's right. we started to workshop this idea. Cam ran with it. And uh, 10 days later, we're like, wait a second. This script is not only good, but it's very shootable. And, uh, and started to put the pieces together very quickly. So moral of the story, it st still starts with a good story and a good script. So wow. we had that That's to work with. That's amazing. And uh, Cam, what was your you obviously had to do something that it had to be zero contact with everyone. <laughs> right. Um, was that, how, how was that process for you? Well, when Rick first, uh, first mentioned it and we first had the think tank, I, my, my initial, um, thought immediately I went to slasher movie, you know, that, um, um yeah. and then Rick, Rick told me, no, 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 no. It, it can't be that. Um, 
<laughs> and so we just kind of toyed around with the idea of, uh, well, what if there is somebody who can go from place to place? And then we were like, well, how does that work? And then and that kind of led us into the, what if it's this technology uh, that allows somebody to teleport? And then, of course, it's revealed that it's it's not just teleportation, it's temporal teleportation that they can do. And so we just kind of backed into it. A lot of it came from avoiding the slasher thing that uh, right. Rick was so smart to, <laughs> to, to say. We figured everybody would probably be trying to make that movie. Right. That, you know? yeah, exactly. that's probably, yeah, that's probably The, the other thing, too, that, that was funny is that, you know, you had to have this, this person travel around the world. So you kind of had, you know, as you can see, it's a different person wearing wardrobe, which is a black right. hoodie that we could assume we could get in every country and be accessible. <laughs> right. Uh, right. Which is also, a little, <laughs> you know, not a, not the best photo doubles in every country, but uh, it certainly made it work. You know. Well, what was interesting was that there was a lot of movement in the film because you have people literally in their homes, you know, shooting. I mean, as a director, but yet with whoever edited, I didn't actually check the editing, so I apologize, but. The editor, there was a lot of movement within the actual uh, film itself. So it didn't feel like, it felt like a, a film that was moving. And I didn't feel like the characters were even trapped at this point. I felt like they were moving around. You know, one of the things was, is that, you know, even though it was, you know, a few months into the pandemic, you kind of realized right away that whatever we do, it can't feel like you're sitting on a Zoom movie. Mm -hmm. um, that there would be other people out there making Zoom movies that we all even at three months in, we're living on Zoom and it's gonna drive people crazy if it feels like they're watching a Zoom movie. Um, so you kind of had to find production value in every little place possible. And that was, you know, camera movement. It was, you know, sound design. You have, uh, we obviously used a lot of stock footage just to get us outside of these spaces for establishing, mm -hmm. having the drone shots, you know, that takes you out of, oh wait, I thought it was a Zoom movie, you know? Right. Um, I think one of the coolest things that we experienced is that when we saw the film for the first time in a big screen at the, you know, at the Gromans Theater, actually, and Cam and I were there going, wait a second, this, this actually not only does it not feel like a Zoom movie, but it holds up in a big movie theater, which, you know, nobody yeah. was going to movie theaters at the time. So, yeah, Cam, I, I'm sorry, George, I, I told you I was going to do this. That's okay. <laughs> I had one. I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> One question on when you were writing, you had to be conscious of the fact that every actor had to sort of be their own cinematographer or at least their own yeah. um, lighting. You know, how, how did you, your thought process as you're writing, did you take that into account as you're putting, creating characters or was that something that you figured Rick will have to figure out. <laughs> At first, it was Rick's going to have to figure it out because I, I, I wanted it. I wanted to um, get through it as quickly as I could because we, yeah. you know, we really were. Uh, we were. We we created some pressure on ourselves, kind of for the exercise of it, but also just to you know just to be moving and be doing. The, the, it kept our mind off of the pandemic and all the crazy stuff that was going on. So we poured everything into it, and then once I wrote it. It was sitting down with Rick and with the DP, Ed Lucas, and figuring out, okay, this is going to be a security camera. This will be this kind of camera. This will, And then uh, Ed and Rick and I, but, but mostly Ed and Rick, kind of designed it from the script to what, what could we, you know, what can we accomplish in each house? How many cameras does this actor have? You know, if he's got, you know, <laughs> You know, well, for, so for we, clarity, Cam, you were a producer too. So you're like, oh, wait, right. I also have to solve the problem that I wrote. <laughs> right. right. So that added a layer. That's true. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's amazing. So what are, I, I'm, I'm just curious to find out what are uh, some of the obstacles that you had to go through to get this done? Because I mean, obviously you're dealing with, you know, I know you're traveling all, all around and trying to, you know, go. I know I think you were working outside of some people's houses with their Wi-Fi and and trying to deal with signal issues and stuff like that. Talk a little bit about that whole process. You know, I, I think the biggest issue right from the get go was convincing people that it wouldn't be a waste of their time. Right, you know, right. not that they had, you know, they had anything else going on. All right. these days. What, what were they going to watch on Netflix was the biggest you know, decision they had. Um, Tiger King. But I think. Sorry, right, that was huge. Um, but, you know, the thing was, is, is convincing them that it's possible and, right. you know, how it's written and how we'd walk them through it and kind of hold their hand. 
And then it was kind of the technical aspects of, you know, we'd have Zoom calls that were essentially a location scout. And we'd have all the technical department heads <clears throat> on the location scout, including something that's unusual. We'd have the editor. By the way, the editor is Hakan Carlson, an incredible uh, editor from Sweden. Yeah. But like we'd be on the, the Zoom for a location scout. And they would walk around with the laptop. And we'd say, okay, great. That, that's going to work for scene 38. Great. Can you just turn the light on? You know what? Grab the lamp from that room and just make a note. That's going to work in the other room for tomorrow night when we shoot, you know, scene 80 or whatever it's going to be. Yeah. And and then they, the people, you know, the actors would kind of note it. And, you know, we had a great AD, which is also, a, you know, made the set feel real. So Artie Carlson, you know, we had a, a board essentially. And he's like, okay, guys, you know, for scene 38, it's going to be, you know, Alex is, uh, you know, den. And over here, it's going to be his kitchen. And, and then that was, you know, you would, zoom in the next day for the set and it's like you know it's uh he came out of his trailer which means you know his bedroom and wardrobe, right. <laughs> and uh we would shoot but you know convincing people it could be real yeah uh, was the biggest biggest issue out of the gate uh, and it's funny because you know you're getting sir anthony hopkins on this and yeah, i'm I like okay how are that. you getting him to buy in to this whole vision of this movie you know i think I think the thing was in the very beginning that the way that we knew we were going to shoot it, you know, each actor by themselves, right? We kind of knew in the back of our heads that there's an opportunity here to save one character for a later date, right? right, right. And <clears throat> the thing is, is that, you know, the way that we shot it, like no actor, because a lot of people think that we just zoomed in and recorded, right? And then you would take the footage from Zoom or you'd have a camera. But that doesn't work because that's not a releasable film because the quality is not good. Right, right. 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 So every actor shot themselves. They never met the other actors. There was like one table read, which was a broken internet feed of a table read, and that doesn't work. But the coolest thing is that you'd have like Chris Brochu, you know, performing this awesome performance. Right. And I'm sitting here going, he's he's acting opposite the AD. Right. Yeah. And you realize that this like lack of chemistry because he doesn't even know who's playing the other part yet. Right. Wow. And and that lack of chemistry is what we've all lived in three years. Right. right. This nope. this lack of emotion and connection, which I really believe plays into the movie. Yeah. Because yeah. you see them come together in the end, but they're coming together online just like we've all had to do, you know. Yeah. Um, but that lack of chemistry is the coolest thing that I think really worked for the film. The, the writing is so great. There's um, there's that opening monologue with uh, Anthony Hopkins, and and there's a well, there's a lot of sections where he just is really really inspiring, and he's kind of like almost like it's a narrative about what's happening in the world, just in general, like about you know being trapped in technology and being a, a pawn to the planet. And um, Cam, when when you were writing, did you know? Uh, Sir Anthony Hopkins was going to be saying your words. Um, I, I did not initially, but then once we got him on board, we, you know, we we got together and worked on rewrites to mm. try to suit it a little to him. There, there's certain, there's a couple of the monologues that uh, that are the same as they were when, um, before, but then we we couldn't resist, you know, trying to find ways to have him say things that you. You know, that it's sound gravitas. cool coming it's out of like, yeah. Yes. yeah, take yeah. advantage of who he is. Yeah. And then, of course, he was uh, he was really fun with a lot of it, too, because he would say, um, we'll be on the Zoom. We were in his uh, driveway, basically. Right, Rick? Yeah, and yeah, he would exactly. uh, he would say, I don't think I'm going to say that one, Cam. I don't, I don't like that one. OK. <laughs> <laughs> right. OK. <laughs> What are you gonna say? <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. So I wanted to actually ask you um, about the uh, Enderby Entertainment. Um, we can. We're gonna obviously we'll talk more about uh, Zoom um, Zero Contact as well. But um, tell me, I read. You know, I went onto your site and the purpose and the values that's on the page, and it's so inspiring to see that because it's one of those things where. You know, in the industry, you kind of um, expect, uh, maybe I shouldn't say that, but sometimes you, it's just nice to see and to read those words on your site that you really care about not only the work, 
but you care about the crew, you care about the investors, you care about the project, you care about the writing and the storytelling being the most important thing. Um, how did that come about with you and Cam when you guys decided to put this together? Because it's such an important, for me, I've seen a lot of different, uh, these agencies, it's such an important thing to read. And I was like inspired by it. You know, um, Dan Petrie Jr. is my business partner and him and I founded the company in 2006. Um, we had met in 1999 doing a film in Vancouver that he was producing and was one of the writers on. And I kind of took his lead ultimately. I mean, the Petrie family in general and everything that he has to offer, you know, very gracious, very much the mentorship program. And that was, you know, who I looked up to and, and our partnership kind of bled into the philosophy of what Enderby would be. And I think it is in our DNA that, you know, we live by the life's too short motto and, and you pick your partners and you, you know, every time you make a film, you're really getting married and that, uh, that marriage is going to bring kids and the kids are going to go to college, which means someone's always going to have to look after that film, you know? And I think sometimes yeah. people forget that is that a film on this little independent film that goes to Sundance, what happens to it in 10 or 15 years, right? right. It needs to be relicensed. You got to file taxes. You got to check the collections, all these things that people don't think about. Right. Um, but as Enderby, we really were focusing on, you know, just working with the right people and developing people that think the same way. And we do a lot of work with the Austin Film Festival, the Austin Screenwriting Conference for the same reasons. And that is, you know, to try to create a mentorship, to try to, you know, find more team members and just kind of offer our advice and our opinions as to what we've experienced. And, you know, my, my role is to continue what Dan started and the Petri yeah. family in general has yeah. started. So I think that that was, it's probably what makes us unique a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can't, we don't get to make movies without collaboration and right. that includes investors, you know, look after the people you work with. Yeah. It's important. Uh, Cam, do you, do you, um, how was your involvement? I, I, I met Rick and Dan, um, several years ago when I was working for another company and I, um, was they, Dan was uh, kind enough to uh, ask me to do a rewrite on this uh, project we were doing with my old company. And the, the movie never happened, but I just stayed friends with Rick and Dan through the years. And then um, when there was uh, finally room, I uh, jumped ship and came <laughs> over. And it, and it and was lucky. because of, and it was because of the, the, the very values that you see written about on the website. It was, you know, life's too short. It, the, the, old job wasn't always very fun. I got a couple of movies made. I wasn't always happy with them. It was a kind of place where uh, there's a lot of these where it's, they're making a product more than they're making a, a, a film, you know, right. not to sound too artsy, but you right. know, you got to get this guy and this guy and have right. an action scene yeah. every 10 pages. And yeah. A plus B equals <laughs> right. C kind of thing. Right, yeah. right, right. They're not necessarily focusing on the experience of the story. Right. They're focusing right. on what, going to draw but I, don't you find it that in in recent i don't know just recent months actually i guess that people are really want to get films that actually inspire um and have a different take like you know the marvel series it's such a huge huge thing you know but you kind of understand it and i love it i have a five-year-old son we uh, geek out on it so we love it um but you know, when you have a, a an organization that can really storytell with a purpose, I find it that Hollywood, maybe not Hollywood, but there are organizations that are doing that more. Is that is that something that I'm just uh, lost here in Nashville seeing? <laughs> I mean, I, I think personally that like society is getting smarter, and there the culture is having a comeback, and interest in other topics and other pieces of storytelling and art are becoming more appealing to the younger audience. Yes. And I think, you know, the theater business is going to have a comeback uh, mm -hmm. in a big way. And obviously Maverick and the Marvel movies are making that happen. Mm -hmm. right. But there's an interest that those 16 year olds are having for non Marvel movies, you know, and I think that's going to bode well, probably for next summer. I think you're going to see more, more films in movie theaters that aren't Marvel movies. Cause right, right now that seems to be, all that there is. And, and of course, the theater business needs that because coming out of COVID, you need right. to fill the theaters. Otherwise, there won't be a theater business. But 
people are getting smarter and they have a wider appeal in terms of interests. And I think that's driven a lot by the streamers that are providing international content. You know, Squid Game is a massive hit. That's a South Korean show. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I think the 16, 17 year olds, where are we in five, 10 years when you still need to get them to come to the theaters? They're not probably fully interested in the Marvel Universe at that point, or they're, at the very least, they're going to have a wider uh, interest, I think, ultimately. Yeah. And culture is having a comeback. I love that. That should be a t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Great. There you go. <laughs> George? But you know, it's it's, it's and I, I think you're right because even I, I have a 15 year old and she, you know, she, you know, loves movies and stuff like that. And earlier on, you know, when she was a little bit younger, she would like the Marvel stuff. And but I, I noticed that she shied away and she's watching more now, a lot of more meaningful storytelling, you know, whether it's movies or TV shows. I've noticed just by what she's watching and I'm like, hmm. But then I ask her, you want to watch a Marvel movie? She's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. So right. it seems like she, yeah, she's even having that shift, which is very, very interesting. And it's funny as a, as, a, as a dad to watch that shift, you know, in her. Yeah, it's human nature. I, I, I think you're seeing like the, you know, look, there's, it's not just film and entertainment, but like youth are leading, they don't want to be led. Right. right. And it's exactly. like the entertainment that we provide for them, like they're just getting smarter. They're on to the, you know, social media marketing trickery, just like right. maybe 20 years ago. Wait a second, that bus stop shelter ad and that billboard. I right. don't need to look at that and see the ad, you know, and they people still spent millions of dollars doing those. But the eyeballs aren't, you know, like they used to be because that was all you look at. You wouldn't look at a thing called the Internet that we now right. deal with. Right. right. So right. I think you're seeing the youth are on to that. And so they're now focused on what do I want to see, not what do I want to be told to see. Right. Exactly. Um, you're seeing that big shift, I think, right now. Yeah. And and Cam, as a, as a writer, what are your what how do you look at uh, this uh, is this shift so to speak um as a writer? Like are you cuz this film was really sort of like a different kind of almost like a genre that didn't really exist that kind of like you almost like invented in a sense. <laughs> um moving forward, how how does that work? I, I, I feel like people are, are going to be starved for, uh, look, the Marvel movies are great. I, 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 I complain about them and then I like almost every one of them when I finally <laughs> watch them. Because, you know, they should they, say they that. Know, they're great entertainment. They, they, oh, they yeah. know what they're doing. Those guys, they know what they're doing. But I also, I've got a 19 year old son and now he's like, Jeez, Thor movie, another Thor movie? Okay. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. exactly. Yeah. And he, he would rather go see stuff like the Blumhouse stuff. And right, right. Because it's just been, it, it's when, just when smart, you think about it, edgy, when, when right? you think about it, like we're, you know, when I was a kid, there weren't a bunch of comic book movies. There was Superman, right. that's it. Right. And so, you know, I wanted that to be, but we're, we're now we've got a generation of younger kids who they've, all they've ever known is, is comic book movies yeah. that's all they've ever known and so it um it's probably like um westerns were in like the 60s where they just kind of got oh, yeah. phased out it's like they you know we're we're, we're tired of cowboys we're, we're we're tired of it yeah yeah that's um, interesting that's interesting. and you know my son even recently the the new um hawkeye i told him you know new episodes you know and he was like oh okay and he wasn't as excited, you know, he has the action figures and everything and he doesn't play with them as much. So there is this idea of it, um, of something that is so much of it that it almost gets watered down to see somebody yeah. fight a thousand people and save the day. And it's sort of like, yeah, we saw that last time. Right. right. How do you, you how do you want to have the stunts? soup? Right. <laughs> you can't have the Super Bowl every weekend. Right. You know? exactly. And it's, right. it's right. not an event. Exactly. It's not an event if there's one every week and there's 10 right. of them streaming at the same time on yeah. Disney Plus, yeah. which is not the same. We, we should say, and a shout out to our dear friend, Alex. Alex, Bonavich, yes. <laughs> no, we'll be true. happy to get yeah. your five year old son, the Tracksuit Mafia, signed action figure. <laughs> so. Alex, I'm sure you're listening or we'll watch this on repeat. I'm sure we yeah. can make that happen for your five-year-old yeah. son. Alex was cool. He actually reshared one of the, the things that I shared on social media. So nice. we appreciate it. So yeah, he really wanted to be here. He really wanted to be yeah, here. That's cool. to yeah, that's cool. Yeah, he's great. And yeah. um uh, Gen Zeros, I think I was uh checking oh, that yeah. out. I was like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, this is awesome. And that actually leads me into uh NFTs because this is really an amazing thing. It's something that I've heard about, I've heard of Gary Vaynerchuk talk about it. I've heard of all these other guys. I'm in, in the space um, 
And to see that, to see this film and to see that uh, it's an NFT product now, um, tell me a little bit about how that started. Um, we made the film and once we saw the outcome of it, we realized that maybe it would be a disservice to release this film in a traditional sense. And we were fortunate enough to be working with some tech guys involved in this space. And I reached out and said, hey, listen, what would it look like if we had, you know, a 95 minute NFT and, and what is that cost and fuel and, and how does this work? And within a couple of days, we kind of had a structure laid out to build this platform called Viewly. And ultimately, you know, it took about six to eight months to build it. And we launched on OpenSea as kind of the billboard to Viewly. Mm -hmm. And now Viewly has been operating since February, March, and it's, uh, you know, going through the process and being part of Yuli, you realize this is probably a real way to release your movies. Going back to what we were just saying about the youth, you know, it's like the 16 year olds are OK with digital transactions. They're OK with digital oh. content. Mm -hmm. You know, does every 16 year old have a hard wallet and NFTs? No, not necessarily. But that mindset, right, moving forward in four to five years, it's not a big deal to own an NFT. You know, it won't right. be called an NFT in four to five years. It'll have some name. It'll be, uh, you know, less the stigma behind NFT and Bitcoin ultimately. Yeah. And I have an 11 year old daughter and she's on, you know, Roblox. And so she yeah. buys a, a fancy hat. Well, that fancy right. hat is a digital, it's an NFT. Yeah. You know? And uh, so, of course, it's, it's all going to go in that direction at some point. You know, I think that it, I find it exciting at the same time. I find it a little confusing because like, what can you add into it that provides more value, not just for the 16 year olds and the kids that understand it, but for the older generations that are still want to, some might want to go to a drive-in at some point, but you know, just want to go to the theater. That still, I don't know how that balance is gonna, is gonna go. Well, you, you know, first off, I, I hope the 11 year old didn't have that transaction in your credit card. Uh, watch for all, more all of those. my credit card because then you do have a whole NFT yeah, yeah. It just yeah. happens to sit in her wallet um, <laughs> I, I think the thing is is that what people you know trying to understand NFTs and what's the difference from the, the Lionsgate release in our case and Lionsgate's a great partner that we worked with and the NFT uh, community and let, let's talk about web 3 too for a second web 3 in the future of where we're going with things is essentially to sum it up is there's many ways to define it, but it's almost a decentralized world, a decentralized globe with no borders, which right. means kind of open honesty, transparency. Imagine a world of positive culture and po positive in nature with no negative feedback and reviews and trolls and bullying online. That's really where Web3 is, is going, yeah. right? And so the NFT offering in a film and the magic word utility that we all point to what is the what does that mean and what is the utility for this film or this you know board apes right or the jack dorsey tweet there was no utility with that and then you question well why has the value gone down this it was just a piece of paper on a wall there was no utility it didn't get you dinner at jack's house or anything like that right so the nft holders in our films and every film that Viewly releases uh we look at it like a treasure trunk of utility and you open it up and if it's a film that's in development, here are the things that you can add to your list of utility, right? If the film is completed, that's going to have a different set of utility. A few things mm -hmm. at the crossover, but you're not coming to the set because the film's done, right? right. And, and then there's maybe a sequel. In our case, like you might be able to get a ticket to Antarctica because you're in our community and you're growing with us and we're listening to the community. So it's a lot, you know, it's a lot different than a traditional release because it allows us to connect with the fans when they leave the movie theater. When you go to see Maverick, you go to see Marvel, you leave the movie theater, you're gone. You don't connect to the distributor or the movie makers, right? right. You're going to stand by to see the next Marvel movie. So it's really about like engaging this community that's along for the ride with you. And you give them something, they give us something positive in nature, future of Web3, give them an NFT and build a community. Yeah. And value will increase as the time and also the product, the project itself gains a whole life in itself. And uh, so it's all about well, investing in that product. Yeah. At the very least, I mean, we, we, you know, we never sell NFTs to say, buy now it's worth more later. Right. We're right, providing right, 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 right. 
you know, an NFT that has utility. Yeah. But you know, when you buy a Blu-ray, what happens after you've watched it a couple of times? You're either going to give it to right. your buddy, it's going to go to the, the cottage, or it's going to be at a garage sale for a dollar. That's yeah. the extent of the life of a Blu-ray. An NFT, if you continue the community and you continue the brand and the product and you build from that, it will always have a life. Is the value going to exceed that you purchased what you purchased it for? Right. More than, more than likely if you have that community around it. And also scarcity. There's only so many of them. Correct. It's like if you had like a it's like baseball cards in a sense too. You know, it's like we have the rookie mm -hmm. card and that's that one rookie card and it's in mint condition. Well, there's the value right there. You know, somebody that well, you didn't know was going to become, you know, you know, somebody. when you were, when you were a kid and you're collecting, you know, the, the basketball set, did you know that there was only 1000 Michael Jordan rookie cards made? Right, you, right. you didn't know that as a kid, right. you just kept spending your allowance trying to get the one, <laughs> exactly. but it's like, no, there only was a thousand, right? Yeah. So it's like the Willy Wonka ticket. You need the rich guy to buy the factory of chocolate bars to get the ticket, you know? Gosh. Um, and that's, that's because it was scarce. And that mindset is where we we're going. But everybody collected the set, but you missed a couple because there wasn't that many prints. I remember just eating that hard gum and just putting the cards down. Who knew? Yeah. Who knows what I had there? <laughs> yeah. A million or, or, or making a, on your bicycle. Right. Making the, mo the motorcycle. Yeah. It's like, exactly. damn, I was a Wayne Gretzky rookie card. Like, you know? Can you imagine? Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. There goes that, that $2 million card. But hey, at least my bike sounded good. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. George, I got one question. I know you go right ahead. Go right ahead. Um, go right I actually ask us, um, Cam, you had mentioned earlier, I'm going to put up uh, this. Um, you had mentioned earlier pressure. You put your, you put pressure on your, on yourself to kind of like write and to kind of get things going. Cause I think during the pandemic, I think it was one of the traps that a lot of people kind of ran into. I started this with George and we were like, well, we got to do something. We got to go meet people. We got to do something, you know. Uh, we're both musicians. We played in bands together and we recorded records. I'm a filmmaker. So we, we're very creative people. Um, what kind of pressure did you put on yourself to say, okay, I want to um, get this done by this? You know, how was that a difficult thing during this pandemic with all the you know uncertainties that were going on? I wouldn't say it was difficult because I... It, it, and I don't, I don't mean that to sound like, you know, this is easy for me. It's not difficult right. because I love to do it. Right. Um, I, I love just sitting in my computer and figuring out a story and, you know, and then seeing that I, do I, how was it, Rick? How was it? I, I think I, I, I bugged him like the day I turned in the script, I would send him a slack every 10 minutes. Did you? Did you all right, have you have you read it yet? Are you are you reading it? Are you? Yeah. Um, because it's just fun. It's it, pressure. Right. It might not be the right word. It's the. I mean, it's an interest. It's a drive. It's a passion. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, this guy was the a drive. A drive as you'll ever meet. Yeah. yeah. To, yeah. to be clear. Yeah. What was that? He, he's the fastest writer you'll ever meet. Who delivers oh, wow. like a grade stuff? You know. So it's like. Wow. When you deliver something, you kind of need to drop everything and read it because it's really, read. really damn good. And they will say, how the hell do you deliver this in 10 days? Wow. Um, you know, and which is a good, you know, writing in Antarctica, you know, Ken oh, yeah. basically wrote, you know, uh, chapter three in Antarctica uh, under those frozen cold conditions. But there he is writing, there working is, on writing. part three, you know. Wow, that's amazing. Okay, George, I'm going to give you a, a chance. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, just actually two things. Um, one, uh, Cam, I was just wondering because you, you, in one of the things that hit me with this film was uh, the father and son relationship. Mm -hmm. That it, that that one really hit me because it, it kind of reminded me of, of of similar stuff that I went through with my dad when you know my dad has passed, but he, you know, kind of really he, him him and I had a rocky relationship and didn't do a lot, and so it kind of that thing kind of hit me. So I was just wanted to know a little bit about you know the thinking behind that also. But just another question before I lose it, I just and again, this is the musician in me that I just noticed it. Three out of the five people on that film had guitars behind them. Yeah. <laughs> okay what was the what was it done by design and how yeah. and what was the you know what was the whole point of it? Yeah, alex had a really nice esp the yeah exactly the smashed yeah. i was like that was a nice bass 
Yeah, that was supposed to be like a literal axe, wasn't it, Rick? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what do we have we to work What about this? <laughs> right, right. Your, your bass guitar, yes. It was perfect. Yeah, you know, by the way, me, yeah. um, Alex was in a band, right, years ago. Yeah. And they oh, yeah. re recorded new songs. Yeah. He'll make, uh, he hates when I say it, but it sounds like Sepultura. If somebody could pull up, uh, <laughs> I'm sure it's on a Spotify or on his Instagram. Um, He's in, in a band, like a hardcore rock band. It's pretty cool, actually. Yeah, I, I, I've checked that out. And I've also, uh, he's also a boxer and comes from a boxing family. And it's yeah, sure does. Does. Yep. yeah, yeah, he's a very uh, creative guy. We're going to check all that out and we'll, we'll tag him on stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but um okay george uh, your question was about father and son yeah i'm just that, just curious right, about that whole that you know that. that piece of the father and son thing how that came about or just you know i i, I just i had um my father passed away also um i had an amazing relationship with him for, okay. you know so never went through anything like this but it just um honestly it feels like fatherhood is um it's a really strong theme to me because we 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 live in a world where, just my opinion, we've devalued fatherhood a little bit. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, agreed. Agreed. And so it, uh, it to me it resonates because it's so um, because of that devaluation uh, that yeah. we've you know that I perceive I you know you you guys do too not not everybody agrees with us but right, it right, right. just. It, it's it's just uh, you know you, you go back to like Field of Dreams and 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 movies like that that um, that last scene you know, where explore they that ball, oh yeah when yeah. I and and so that was kind of the inspiration was um, what it, I didn't have a, a dad like that okay but just you know kind of thought from um, you know came up with the Finley character first. Okay. When when we were talking, that was one of the first ones we came up with. And then when we had to start with the um, when I when I was when we were coming up and talking about the the other characters, I I had the idea for the son being the proxy. And then it was like, what kind of dad would this guy have been? I don't think he would have been exactly. you know there all the time. Right. And exactly. so then it just it was just natural to explore that theme once I once I had thought of those two characters it just felt like the natural way to go yeah because it, it really it, it hits you especially when you you look at okay this guy is you know a driven guy the the father's successful and driven and he's he's making all these things happen but at the expense of the family dynamic maybe mm -hmm. or the you know the relationship with the son and then later on where he actually says you know i wasn't there maybe i you know he kind of admits you know i know i I, I I wasn't there like I should have been for you. And it's a very pivotal moment yeah. in that movie. I think you're spot yeah. on too about the the fatherhood. You know, I never met my dad, but my grandparents raised me, and my grandpa was my dad, and he was amazing, and it was awesome. Um, but that, and I remember my I had other my stepdad who's passed, and I won't say anything negative, but there was a lot of issues there, and I remember always thinking to myself, when I have kids, I am going to be right. so different exactly you know and i think exactly. that that's lost yes like we're not what well, you know and i don't want to get into a whole thing but i mean george and i talk about it all the time because yeah. we're from the south bronx we grew up with like nothing you yeah. know we had to fight our way out and i just thought to myself you know why would we grow up and be mean to our children or ignore them i'm gonna treasure them yeah. you know exactly and so anyway that that uh in the film when he's you know he starts crying and um yeah and i think you know he realized that he really put a lot of effort. Of course, he made him a time traveler. <laughs> so, I mean, my grandpa provided didn't make something. Music. Yeah, provided you know, something. my grandpa, you know, yeah. he bought me a guitar, but he didn't, you know, I couldn't time travel. But, um, and Bruce, you just killed it in that scene, man. He just crushed oh, it. Yes, and, I agree. You know what? Ken, good. that was the scene where, like, we're all, we're all zoomed in, and, and you had the, you know, Tink, the production designer, the editor, the whole production crew is on Zoom. And and Chris, who is a dear friend and an amazing actor, just like crushes it, pours his heart out on Zoom, and you just look around like the Brady Bunch. I'm looking at each screen, and everyone's just like, <laughs> like yes, that's right, when right. we knew, yes, this is going to work, right? Right? And it was like, because and everybody it, bought in at that point. Yeah, yeah. Because it, it was it was really fun shooting all of it, and and like when we were when we were doing um, Alex's uh, 
scene or even um, uh, Martin Steinmark. It was a lot yeah, of fun. Yeah. And there was, right. you know, we were all on a Zoom and we were laughing and joking. And and then for most of those shoes, we're doing that. And then we get to that part and it's just like you could hear a pin. Everybody was just, yeah. you know, nobody yeah. nobody was laughing anymore. Nobody was, yeah. um, there's my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> and I could actually uh, envision that, you know, just what would be going on in the back and, in, in, you know, be in the behind the scenes because of how how emotional some of those scenes were, how scary mm -hmm. some of them were. I jumped a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But at the same time, like I know in the back, you know, there has to be either nobody there <laughs> <laughs> or there's some, you know, everyone. Or the wife. The whole, or the, the whole wife. Room. Or the right. dad. Or the, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's really amazing. I know we only have like four minutes because I know Rick has, to, has an appointment. Um, what are you guys working on now? Um, and, you know, and, and where can uh, we see it? I know obviously I'm going to put up the website. But what are you working on now? Uh, well, well, first off, Viewly right now is we're we're onboarding more titles, and that's going to be a really cool experience. Kind of going through the process, releasing a bunch of new movies on Viewly, awesome. and and making that a consistent thing where you can build a community and ultimately be part of your finance plan when you're making movies. And that's a lot of the questions: right. is how can you use that to help finance your film? So that's really exciting stuff that we're doing at Viewly. Yeah. Enderby, we are gearing up for maybe three to four films before the end of the year. It's pretty busy over here. We are, you know, post COVID still dealing with, you know, COVID costs and stuff that are associated right. with production. But yeah. we are seeing a big, you know, rush to get content. A lot of these distributors, you know, obviously didn't have content. So uh, through right. COVID, so it makes it puts us in a better position. But yeah. we have uh, a few films coming up that we'll be announcing uh, one in Cuba and possibly one in in europe and then also uh what we're really excited about is zero contact two and three and that's going to yeah. be done conventionally not over zoom i hope right but that's uh we we did start with the antarctica portion we pick it back up in the fall globe trotting uh taking the audience to places that they haven't been before possibly yeah so that'll be a, a fun ride to continue this world of zero contact yeah i love it it's the reset Right. And then I saw it was a, a poll and poll, I think it was. Poll to, um, poll, to poll, part poll to two, poll. the resets, part three. Yeah. Right. Ah, okay. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely looking forward to that. So, Rick Dugdale and Cam Cannon, thank you so much for being on the show. We really, really appreciate you guys taking the time to chat with us. Absolutely. Um, you thank guys are you. awesome. We're going to be following. We're going to be promoting all this stuff. We're going to be clipping this up and sharing it everywhere. And we just thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank Thanks you, for having guys. us, guys. It's a pleasure. Anytime, anytime, we'll we'll do it again. So we really awesome. appreciate it too. Thank, thank you so much, right. guys. Have a great Take care, guys. Take care. All right. Bye. Oh, those guys are awesome. How about that, right? right? Love it. It was great. Great to get an insight on how that all was done because when you really watch that yeah. film, it was just incredible. Yeah, it's, especially on the. Uh, the, the the you know being ceo of a major company like that you know where you're doing independent films but you're also right. doing big films you got right. actors. ben kingsley i didn't i didn't ask about ben kingsley but i wanted to know because I mean, sir ben kingsley is like one of my uh my idols too and you know but just being in that world is always good to see how level-headed and yes. that's really what you do that's really where you can actually get that kind of uh product from being in that type of personality you know and maybe i'm exactly. being a, a overly excited but i get excited as you know george all right well we want to thank everybody for tuning in thank you all so much we'll see you all again next week same time 7 p.m central 8 p.m eastern standard time for counterparts george batista thank you so much have a wonderful uh, uh week and as always peace, peace.